let me make that smaller. Um, and when we think about autonomous navigation uh, overall, we should think about our um, we should we should we should think about our 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 path our problem for doing um, for doing navigation. A sort of uh, a sort of you know we can think of robot pathfinding as placing down a track in space, right? And once we've placed down that track, our robot can follow that that track and it can reach its goal. So in this case, if I'm looking at you know so so let me just think of my 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 robot as a marble, right? And I want my marble to get to a goal location. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the process of laying down of laying down this track. And then once once the, once I've laid down the track, that will be my path. The marble will just go through this. And so once that once the track is in place, the robot only needs to follow the path. And because I love I love cutesy videos, uh, I found this on YouTube to just give you a sense of what this could look like. So so that's our that's our robot. I hope the sound is on this is not too loud. Um, we can't even hear sound. <laughs> well, I can't hear the sound, but uh, but you know, essentially, you should think of the path that we're finding as the track. And once we find the track, the marble is our is is our robot following the path, and it's getting to its goal location in the world. And so that's the essence of robot path robot uh, robot pathfinding. Um, the thing is, is that you know, every time we need to find a new path or get or get to a goal or we get a new obstacle, we don't want to have to manually go through the process of laying down a whole, a whole, uh, a whole set of track. We'd like to be able to do that autonomously, and for that, we're going to use autonomous pathfinding algorithms. Um, and so, you're going to, by the way, you're going to get a lot of marbles in this uh, <laughs> in, this, in this lecture. Um, there we go. Reaches the goal. Great. That's awesome. Oops, let me uh, just plug it in here real quick. And so, uh, so you know, so this is just one example, but there's many other examples of, of seeing this. And I, I saw this uh, saw this on TV one time and I thought it was pretty cool. It's the marble sports. Has anybody seen the, the marble sports? It's somebody with a lot of time on their hands and they, uh, and they essentially have, uh, they essentially do marble races. So they lay out a track and then once the once the track starts, they uh, you know they essentially are doing racing with the with these marbles. So the so the path that, that the marbles are following are laid out, right? That's what our pathfinder is going to doing. In this case, it's the it's the the person uh, the person that laid out the track. Um, and then the, then the road then the execution just happens by the ex execution just happens naturally. Um, in this case, gravity is doing most of the work for us. The track plus the plus the um, plus the path because the path is a slant will do all the work for us. And they did it not just in this sort of Formula One case, but they've done off road, and uh, and, and this one's on this one's on ice. Um, there we go. My computer's a little slow there here today, but you know, but essentially, you know, we could think of our, we could think of the, once we found a path, we can think of the motion of our robot as a, um, as a, as a, um, as sort of just the motion of a marble following along the path. There you go. And there's some videos. If you want to watch the, watch this yourself too, I'll put when, when I put the lecture slides online. So there we go. So this gets back to our goal, what we're trying to accomplish in this class, which is we're trying to give you the power of autonomous navigation. So how do we get our robot to go from point A to point B? And creating a creating a, a path like this or a map is one possible option. And so just coming back to it, what's what's just as a refresh, what's the simplest approach for our robot to, to get to a goal? Just a, as a refresh. Yeah, Julius. Random, you know, so if we want to think about, oops. I'm ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Uh, wait, I'm gonna come back. Just hold that answer. I'm 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 out of slide. I'm out of, I'm out of sync with my slides. Um, if we think about autonomous navigation again, um, we're going from a start location to a goal location. And if we think about doing this by a local search method, we would think of our our robots navigation as following the local motion of a marble. We could think of it that way, it's like following locally what the best best route is along a path. Given that we've already laid down the track, we found a global path in our in our sort of global workspace um, that's a given to us. And so, one uh, one interesting way of thinking about that is, you know, if let's let's say that you um, that you're laying down a track yourself for marbles to go down, right? And so in this case, the global part of it is that you are you as the as the person are doing the pathfinding for the robot. You are going through and saying, I want the I want the ball, the marble to end up at this spot at the end, and you are laying down the path 
for the robot. You are doing the pathfinding for 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 the for the marbles for the robot. And once you once you have the, the that in place, then it's just then it's just the process of execution, and we just let the marbles run. And they're going from this point at the top of the at the top of the ramp, the location at the top of the ramp, all the way down to the bottom, and it's just happening autonomously. So we have to globally, of all the possible places where the marble could be in this world, we want them to to um, to start off, or all the possible places they could go. We want it to go along this path that we've carved out for it, and that's our that's so 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 the part, the carving of the path is our path planning. The motion, the execution is the uh, is is the ex is motion along the path is the execution. All right, Julius, what options do we have for navigating our robot? So, if I want to do the simplest thing possible, uh, as Julius said, we could just move around randomly, right? We don't have to carve out a path. We could just have the robot bounce around and just go everywhere, and then. By chance, it will happen to end up at the at the goal if we let it run around long enough, which is great for things like vacuum cleaners who want to cover area, and we don't want and we want to make it as cheap as possible. Um, another approach is that we could do the bug algorithm as we have before, and so that will navigate us towards our goal, move us towards our goal, um, and it will get us around obstacles. But we could run into into some issues here and there, as you're probably seeing. If we could run, we could we could. Um, we could run into it may not be the fastest most efficient way to get to where we where we want to go and so what we're going to explore as we get to to the next assignment is we're going to we're, we're actually what we're going to do is we're going to build up a map right and that app is going to represent the open space that's around our robot and once we define what that map looks like we're going to then try to carve out outside of that, that free space. We're gonna to try to find a path and carve out the, the, the path where we want the robot to go. And so we're gonna to talk today, uh, in our activity today is gonna to talk about SLAM, which means simultaneous localization and mapping. And that's what you're gonna to use to do this. And then uh, once, we, once we build on top of that, we can search over all possible paths through inside of this map. And that's gonna give us, that's gonna lead us to our goal location. I know this says A star pathfinding. What we're gonna do is probably more like a breath first search, but we're going to do some form of graph search in order to in order to get from our desired location to our goal location, and that's where we're that's where we're going. Any questions on that before I before I move on? All right. So if we want to find if we want to search over all possible paths, we want to do assignment three, project three. We've got a number of steps that we have to take. So what we're going to first do is we're going to build a map of our environment, and then we're going to represent that map as a graph with a grid layout, right? And so to get a sense, we already kind of showed what this what, what this looks like uh, before, but this is just one uh, one one example that, that we have. And so you should you should look at what we what we have. So the robot's moving around in space, and what you're seeing in the display is you're seeing essentially a, an image where at every pixel. It's either labeled as free space, occupied, or unknown, right? And we're going to assume that, and so each each pixel is going to represent a node with a particular state in it, and then nodes are going to be connected to each other. So, so two pixels that are next to each other represent no nodes that are that are connected by an edge. And this is how we're going to map out our space. You don't have to implement this if you want to take Robotics 330 or EECS 467 or going out Robotics 550. You could learn how we build this map. You're going to use the code that we uh, that we that we have for for this in order to do this. Um, but that's really that's going to be the first step. We're going to try to go try to show you a little bit about how this works at least how you use it today. And then we're gonna build from there. And then once we once we do that, uh, if we wanna search over all possible paths, what we're gonna do is store a sort of a, we're gonna store a route, right? So if I wanna go from my, from my, um, from uh, if I wanna say from my parent node or from my goal node, I wanna store the parent, the next place, the next place I, might, I have to go along the path to get to my, 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 current, my current location. I am talking about parent. I'm going to, oh, there we go. Uh, all right, Yana's bringing robots in. I'm going to let her do that. It can be a little noisy. All right. But essentially, I'm talking about parents and, and nodes. You know, I'll get to that. I was, it's probably too early for me to talk about this. But what I'm really trying to find is a route, right? The same way that Google Maps can find your, find your route from point A to point B, we're going to implement that same algorithm so that you, so you have that listing of where to go if you want to get to a goal. Um, but in the end, 
what we're going to have is a um, we're going to have a uh, we're going to we're going to perform once we have that that graph we'll perform a global search to do routing and then we'll have a local controller to follow that path and what that will look like for us is this sort of example that we've had that we've shown many times where the robot is at the goal location and then it can uh, then we it will if it wants to if it's a start location if it wants to get to the goal it will just move along the route that it's found after it has the map that's been built and then it will uh, it will go to that um, and go to that spot and we can give the we can give this robot any any location in the space and it will be able to 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 go there collision free and that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna build up to and so this is really our plan for for project three we're gonna by the end of it we're gonna check off all these boxes uh, our first step is to check off these uh, the the the, the um, building on the map of the environment. And so what this what this process is called is called simultaneous localization and mapping. So if we're looking in this case top down, right? We've got the Kim bot right there, and we've got the and we and and it's in a real world. It's in the real world. And then over to the over to the side, we've got the the actual uh, the actual space that we're that we're mapping out the the robot's belief about what the what 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 the map looks like. And so um, so what we're what we're showing is the real world. And then the slam, the slam output, right? Um, we should note that with this, we've got the actual real robot pose. So that's the true pose of the robot in the map, in the in the world. And then a ro the robot maintains the localized robot's pose. That's where the robot believes it is inside of this map, right? Um, right now, you're working with the current estimate of localization that is given to us strictly by odometry, the odometry of the robot. Um, and so the mapping gives us another way of, of estimating that pose. And to, oftentimes, it's a bit more accurate because it's both taking in that odometry and moving it forward and also reconciling that against its, its current map. Um, and so we have our real true pose and we have the robot's belief about what the pose is. The robot's map is represented as, as I said, as this as this graph, where at every location we're going to note that that we could label it as occupied, as a black pixel right here, or we can label it as uh, as free space, which is in white, and then anything we can't see because we because we don't we don't know where where we we can't see it, uh, we're going to label as unknown, right? And so this is what this is what we get out of the out of the slam output. Any questions about slam output? Everything clear? No, no confusion. Anybody want to guess what that purple, what those purple pixels are? No, come, no, no, you, come on. <laughs> I, I like that thought a lot. I, there's a particular word that I would uh, I would use. Julius, do you have a do you have a thought? I I like I like where you guys are heading with this. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, feel the vision is, is close. I like that. I like F. There's, is there is there a word that starts with F that might uh, might say what those what those purple pixels are? What's that for rendering? <laughs> yeah, brain close, different F word. So I'll tell you what those pixels represent. So so everywhere that you're seeing, you know, you'll notice that in the other areas of the map, you'll see that there's a black pixel. And the black pixels always separate free space from unknown space, right? So we can't see through through something that's occupied. So we're gonna so we can do that. But when we get to our pixels down here in purple, what those represent are pixels that do that don't that are that are free space next to next to unknown space. There's no there's nothing occupied in between, right? And so what that looks like, what that's called is a frontier, right? So in those purple areas, basically saying we have unknown space near free space, so we might be able to go there and explore this space, and that could lead us to new uh, new areas that we don't we didn't know were open before. And so so oftentimes, what our robots will do is go explore that front that frontier until there's no more frontier left, and then we we've 
we've essentially mapped out our space. Does that make sense? Do I get a thumbs up? Thumbs up, all right, awesome. There we go, I need to get more thumbs up too. <laughs> um, all right. So just to, to see how this works, we've seen uh, SLAM work in, in some of these other cases, but I will just play this video so you can see it work in another situation here. So this is when this was, uh, this is actually when we're doing early development for this class. And we were like, is this mapping gonna work on our on our on our uh, on our robot? And it, it was working pretty good. And so you can see as it moves around, the frontier goes away because we go into that, those frontier areas, we explore it and we realize what's occupied and what's not occupied, and then the frontier expands out. And so we can get a pretty good, we can get we can build up a pretty good map like this, right? And so, you know, so so we're working with sort of, uh, you know, we're working with this uh, the SLAM system here. You'll note that it's not it's not quite perfect. Um, uh, here, let me share this. So one thing you'll note is that not it's not quite perfect in that we'll get, you know, there'll be some edginess and jaggedy stuff on the on the on, you know, at the borders. And that really is just because you know, because there's noise in the world, we're not using the best sensors possible. Or in fact, we're not using the best mapping algorithms possible. We're using something that fits on the computational load of, of this robot. And so there's ways that can do much better. And so if as you go along in your career, you want to use fast slam, uh, or you want to use uh, you want to use graph optimizing uh, types of types of systems. There's all sorts of ways you can go. There's there's a whole world out there of of algorithms that you could use, but we're just using sort of the baseline SAM SLAM system. Um, but you can go even further than that. So the same systems that we're using, we use on our fetch robot. So if you remember the first day of class, for those of you who are here, uh, we showed a demo with the fetch robot, and it's using this laser using this laser rangefinder on it. Um, so with that, we can build out pretty good maps of space. And so this is actually the robot building out a map of space in a, in, in, a, in a larger building. And so as it's moving around, it's building out this, this, uh, this location. Once, we, once we've built out the, the space where the robot can, uh, that it, once it builds out its sort of map of space, then it's just like Google Maps for the robot. We can just click on it and say, go to this location. And so that's really what our autonomous navigation system should do. So if we said, click on it and go to, our lab used to be in the Beister building. We're on the third. We were on the third floor. We could click on it and say, "Go, go inside this. This, uh, go inside the lab," and the robot could do that autonomously. So that's what it's doing right here. Um, these systems work work so well. They work really well that I'm not, I, I'm not afraid to have my my kids. These are my kids and my my niece and my nephew. Um, you know, they're going off and uh, and they're they're uh, you know they, the robot is navigating around them, and so you know, so it's pretty pretty cool. Uh, my kids are a lot bigger now, um, so there we go. Um, makes dad sad to see to see kids grow up so quickly. Uh, but uh, but um, but you know, but these systems work work really well. Um, you can develop these systems on your own. So as I said, if you want to take th robotics three thirty or four sixty seven. Um, you know, that's where you actually, uh, that's where I actually develop one of these systems on your own. So we've had hundreds of students, I guess we're coming up on thousands of students who have come through our classes, who have learned how to build these, uh, build these types of maps and, uh, and can do this. And so, so hopefully, you know, after you take 102, you'll, you want to take one of those classes. Uh, in fact, you'll see a lot of people around the building with these types of robots and building maps. Um, and so that'll be something cool, cool you can look forward to. If you want to go even further, you know, you'll see a lot of autonomous cars these days uh, on the road and you'll see those little spinning things on top and they don't just build two dimensional maps, they, be, they build three dimensional maps. So this is a big point cloud. For those of you who have been here with the first whole class, you've probably seen this video several times now. Um, but, um, but now, but but you know, for those of you who haven't seen it, you know, this is this came off of a, a project that that uh, Professor Ryan Eustace and Professor Ed Olson here had done, where they built out strictly from the laser rangefinders on the on this autonomous car, they built out a, a 3D map of uh, of Ann Arbor. So you saw it built, it built a, a map of the football stadium. Um, this is downtown. I think that is, I think that is Liberty and Maine. I think so. Maybe, 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 yeah. I'm gonna say Liberty in Maine. 
All right. Um, but you can see that we can that, that with this, we can build big three dimensional point clouds. This isn't like this. This was all built autonomously. And so we can build out these maps of space. And, and this is really uh, this is really I mean, and this video was taken, I think, almost eight years ago. So the state of the art has really advanced and you can you can do all of those things. Um, as I said before, our, as we're building our mapping, we at least with these systems we have here, you have to be really careful. These are not, we don't have perfect production quality mapping code. Uh, so, you know, so there's going to be noise. You're going to have to figure out some things about how the SLAM system works and how the robot, you know, works. It's, you know, it's part science, but there's a little bit of artistry to it. Um, but once you build that map, it'll be, it'll be useful for, for actually building our, our, our path planning systems. We should note again that our robot map is stored as an image on the robot and we represent it as a graph. So again, a whole core part of this class is understanding graphs and graph algorithms. And so this is so the graph is going to be our is going to be our main uh, our, our main way of doing things. So if we look at our slam output here, we're going to now just it, we're going to we're going to now turn our our our, um, our output into uh, into a graph. And so what we're going to do is take all the areas that are low, that are that are uh, that have obstacles inside of them. We're going to color them black, representing the state of that that area, that cell. Um, then we're going to take our um, we're going to take all the areas that are free, label them as with white, and then uh, the areas that are known we're going to label those as gray. And so when we want to think of of how we store this map in in terms of our in terms of our memory in terms of our C program. What we're going to do is we're going to represent this as a we're going to represent this as a as a as a vector. So this these are this cell is just one long vector that we that we store in memory, right? And uh, and for for this vector, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to um we're going to note that every instance of the vector represents a node in a graph, right? And so the, we're going to store a number of things in this graph. So for every element of the vector, we're going to store what the x location in the world is for that for that graph for that for that node, the y location, and we're also going to store whether it's occupied or not, or that's true. It was, whether, and, and occupied means that it that it's true. Not occupied means that it's uh, that that it's free space or it could be unoccupied or it could be unknown. And so we're going to use a struct. To represent, uh, so we're going to have this is going to be a vector of structs, right? And so we're going to have uh, a vector of load of, of locations at every node, at every element of the vector. We're going to have a struct that's going to represent, um, that's going to represent the information of that vector, location and occupied. And then every 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 set of of neighboring cells is going to have an edge between them. That's going to say that these two things are connected, and we have to consider the relationship between them. And so that really is is what our map is going to give us. Um, by the way, do we need to set up? Yeah, go for it. Um, and so. Uh, so one thing that we can do once we have this graph, this is not going to be the algorithm that we use, but I want to talk a little bit about what a local search algorithm could do. So once I have my, once I have a, a particular, once I set up my map like this and I have a, and I have a, a goal, what I can do is establish what we call a cost. I can add a cost field to my, uh, to my map. The cost would tell me from this current location right now, how much cost would I expect to go from my current location in this map to the goal? And so if I, if I did this, we would assume that if I met the goal, goal, I have my lowest cost there. And I would have high cost if I hit, hit it something, right? If I bump into something, that's, that's, that's bad, right? I'm going to have, you know, it's going to be costly and it's going to be bad. And then, uh, and then how could I just define cost that it could be, it could be at any, any one of these locations right here? Um, I'll ask you to brainstorm some ideas. So if you see this on video, you can stop, you can pause it, brainstorm some ideas and think about what it, what it's going to do. But for the purpose of this lecture, because I want to get you to, to pair navigation with Yana, I'm just going to say magically, we're just going to define, uh, we're just going to have a function that defines this for us. And it's going to, to use a, what's called, a, what we call a distance transform. And it's just going to populate every location in the, in the grid in our in our graph with a cost for being at that location. So as we're close to the to the goal location, we've got low numbers, right? We're only, you know, it's only low numbers near the goal. As we get further away, the, the cost grows and grows and grows. And um 
and this really sort of, this really sort of lays out what our what you know what the basis of our of our of our path could look like. Yeah, got it. We we use distance transform. I'm going to take that offline. If you want to know what the distance transform does, then 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 I will I will do that. Essentially, what the way one way you could think about it is that we're we're expanding out from the goal and adding more value, more number, more um, more uh, more um, more cost as we get further away. But we're also trying to to stay away from the walls as well. From obstacles, and so we have to we have to consider that as part of our as part of our cost. This is what we did last year. We did the distance transform. That was that was project two. Um, I can't say it went well <laughs> because uh, students were like, "Why is my robot not navigating very well?" And that's real. It's because this approach that I'm talking about doesn't you know it works okay in many cases, but it also has a number of flaws to it. Um, and so so we're just I'm just glancing over it this year, but. Uh, but you know, but we're, and then we're gonna. But instead, you're doing a bug algorithm, which hopefully is much more fun because it, it, I think it actually works. All right. So let's say that I have that distance transform, and I've populated this all of all of this with with a particular cost. Then, if I want to get to the goal, then my robot behaves just like a marble. So what I'm gonna do is what it's gonna do is it's just gonna say, what's my what's the path of what's what from where the marble is right now, it's just gonna go to the, down the steepest direction, right? It's gonna just try to minimize that energy and just go, go straight down the, where gravity takes it. And what that would represent for us is, a, is a, what we call a local search algorithm. So the robot would look around it and it would say, where's my direction of lowest cost? So if it's, if it's currently at, at cost 80, and if it went up, it would increase its cost or it went, to the, went back and it would increase in cost or goes down, it would increase its cost. But if it went to the to the right here, where the cost is less, where it's 78, it's going to move in that direction, right? That's where gravity is going to drag it. So our robot is going to be is going to have our lowest potential go this way, and so our robot would move in that direction. And if we did this over and over and over again, we kind of moved in the direction of lowest cost. Um, what we what would happen was is that we would we would magically so we would have a local search algorithm that would come in. And magically populate our po populate our path to get from our current location all the way to our area of lowest cost. That area of lowest cost is going to be like the basin of the bowl, right? So you know, if you put a marble in a bowl, you let it go, the marble goes, and it it might wiggle around the the bottom, but it's going to drop. It's going to stop at the bottom of the bowl, right? And that's what our local search algorithm is going to do. And so what it's going to what that really what it really looks like in the end if we come back to our mar marble analogy is just sort of carving out this path and it's just having our, our our marble go straight down that path. And so once we do that, then we can have our local controller just follow it down the path and it can go along along right there. And so that is what we're that's what so so the map is our our will our way for us to find uh, paths in this form. And so if I want to look at a finite state machine of what this would look like, um, what or what our robot does in in terms of a local search algorithm is finds it locally finds the direction of lowest cost, and then it moves in that direction, and then it does that over and over and over again until it reaches the the, the area of lowest cost, and then we end program. And that is that is a very simple. This is if people tell you you know I mean I wouldn't call this a full gradient descent algorithm, but if you if you hear the word gradient descent, this is essentially what it's doing. It's not that complicated, and so with that, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna really stop here. We are we are moving towards project three, so we're gonna build a map of our environment. Then we're gonna search for a path in that environment given the map. And then we're going to uh, to um, to have a local controller follow that path, and then at that point you are pathfinding. You are doing, I, you are you are at the at the cusp of the state of the art. In, in robot pathfinding. So, and you did it all, you'll do it all in just two months. You should give yourself a pat on the back for that. Or give yourself a pat on the back after you get the assignment done. How about that? Excellent. Any questions about where we stand right now? Any question about A star planning? With that? A star pathfinding planning. I sort of use planning and pathfinding interchangeably, I shouldn't do that. Pathfinding is planning just for our sort of navigation case. 
All right. Any questions? Delan, any questions? I'll take that as no. All right. So, uh, so with that, um, I'm going to stop here. Um, and we're going to take a quick break. We're going to let Yana, Yana set up for, for the next activity and we'll go from there. All right. Thank you very much. There we go. I like the golf clap. 